people have been asking me, and I know that some mental health professionals have been saying, we just want to reassure them about their safety. And that's a hard thing to do right now. And kids aren't believing us anymore when we reassure them, right? They're, they're not buying it. They're not buying it and it doesn't help with ongoing trust. That's right. Rather than offering that reassurance and saying, you know, everything is going to be fine and you will always be safe. The flip side of that is we don't want to say, well, you're not going to be safe. We don't want to say that. What you want to say is, it is really okay for you to be worrying about this. I'm worrying about this too. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. As we approach summer, we're going to do something a little different than what we did last summer. We are not going to go dark. We're not. No. We are here for you this summer. Yep. Our listeners mentioned that one of their favorite episodes was a series we did at the beginning of season four, unpacking each of the critical skills Lynn always talks about that we want to build with our kids, autonomy, flexibility, and problem solving. So we're going to do another series for the summer. Lynn, why don't you talk about that? So I have seven puzzle pieces. I shouldn't say I, I should say we, because this was work that I did with my pal, Reed Wilson. And it's the seven puzzle pieces that are laid out in Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents. So what I want to do this summer is we are going to do some summer nugget episodes where I am going to talk about each of the puzzle pieces. So every episode is going to be a puzzle piece and they're going to build on each other. So by the end of the summer, you will hear me talk about each of the puzzle pieces that you can put together to manage worry and anxiety in your family. A couple of things. One is, so Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents is a book that you had that came out what year? 2013. So it was for families. And then obviously you have a new book coming out that's for adults this fall. Correct. Thank you for queuing that up for me, Robin. The book is called The Anxiety Audit, and it will be released in October. Yeah, I'm just looking at the final proofs now. It's all designed. It looks great. Well, I just think it's helpful for readers to understand there are core pieces that families use to Mm -hmm. help manage their own family anxiety with their children involved. And then there are also other tools that are really more adults to look at for themselves. Right, right. You got to be aware of your own patterns. Since we know that one of the high predictors for anxious children is when parents aren't addressing their own anxiety, this is a book. In particular, it talks about how does anxiety sneak in and grab hold of you? Because as you often say, like people don't even know that's anxiety or people do that. They don't even see that as anxiety. So that's what this book is about. Great. So for Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents, Mm -hmm. these are the seven blocks. And would you say that this is a great intro and a great review? Or where do you think level-wise for our listeners, where should they place this information? It's certainly a great introduction. If you've been listening to the podcast, what I'm hoping that this will do and what I think it will do is just really put them in order for you. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because People send us a lot of questions. I get a lot of emails from people. And as I'm reading their emails, I can see, okay, so they're picking up on pieces of this and they're getting parts of this and they're listening to that episode and understanding that. This creates the full picture. It really addresses the full process that I use in my therapy. So if you're listening to this, this is really a walk through the steps I take, the sequence that I take when I'm working with a family, when I'm working with parents and children. So it's really going to lay it out in a very clear way. You just said something I think is pretty important. So people who've been listening to the podcast, and a lot of our listeners have also read this book, Anxious Kids, Mm -hmm. Anxious Parents. But if there are seven pieces or seven approaches, and a family might have really adopted and mastered three or four of them, those dangling ones that are still a little tricky... 
can still be keeping the anxiety around. Right. And they might say, well, I did this, but it didn't work. Or I did this, but can you talk more about, I mean, I hear that a lot. Can you say more about particularly the content versus process stuff? People ask a lot of questions about how to externalize the worry. It's sort of like you're picking up an instruction manual. And sometimes the way we do the podcast, we are talking about this problem or that problem. So maybe you're getting a little bit of information about chapter six, or you're diving into the third stage of the instruction manual, this is just going to sequentially take you through it from beginning to end. And that's why they're puzzle pieces, because you need all of these elements for one approach. Yeah, this is an umbrella approach, and we want all the elements to be there. So I'll talk about all the elements that create the puzzle. So when you're looking at the puzzle, you're like, hey, that piece is missing. I'm not sure what to do about it. I've got that puzzle piece, and then here's the next one, and here's the next one. I just want to make it as clear as possible. So that's my goal. So Lynn, what is the first puzzle piece? The first puzzle piece is expect to worry. Really, the core of this puzzle piece is that we have to normalize worry rather than eradicate it, that we want to make worry something that we can experience, that we can talk about. And you know I talk a lot about the elimination culture and how trying to eliminate worry backfires. So we want to start talking to our kids about how worry is normal, how it shows up. And also, we don't want to forget that worry also sometimes serves a useful function, right? Worry sometimes slows us down. It gets us to pay attention to things that we need to pay attention to. And so this puzzle piece, Expect to Worry, is all about making worry okay and moving away from this idea that we have to get rid of it, that we have to talk our kids out of it. An example might be your child is going to a summer camp this summer, going to a day camp, going to a program. And they say, I don't want to go to the day camp. I'm nervous. Or they might even say like, why do I have to go to this? This is going to be dumb. I don't want to do it. I hate going. And so right away, you want to get in there And you want to try and eradicate that. So you offer that reassurance. You say, you know what? This is fun. Oh, your friends are going to be there. I've heard that they're going to do some really fun things. I heard that even on the first day, they're having a water balloon fight. And then you might even move to, look, you can go to this camp. I don't know what you're worried about. There's nothing wrong with going to this camp. So immediately we step in and we try and get rid of it or we try and talk them out of it. When we expect to worry, then we say things like, you know, I totally get it. You've never been to this summer camp before. And you might not even know a lot of the kids when you go there. We have an idea of the schedule, but we don't know exactly what it's going to be. So if I were you and I were starting the first day of something new, I bet my worry would show up too. And then you can give an example. You can say, I remember when, or you can say, remember last year when I started that new job? In the morning, when I was getting ready to go to my first day, I was feeling a little shaky. I felt like I had to pee. My hands were a little shaky. I was inside. I was worrying and wondering. So this is totally what we would expect when you're starting something new. And begin to talk about the fact that worry shows up, that we feel it, that oftentimes we can't even see it inside of other people. This was Reed's example in the book where he talks about these golfers that were playing for a championship and the guy won, right? So he wins the PGA championship. And then in the interview afterwards, the golfer said, I was so nervous that I couldn't even feel my legs. My hands were shaking. I was like banging on my legs to feel them. I was so nervous. Now, if you're watching this guy sink this putt to win this big golf tournament, you'd have no idea what he was experiencing because he's not revealing it to us. It's really okay to give kids permission to feel this very normal emotion. We want to normalize it. We want to expect it. We want to stop treating it like it's breaking news. We want to stop trying to talk kids out of it and give them that reassurance. It is okay for kids to feel worry. It's interesting when you say that because I think of the horrible examples of content that are in the world right now, 
And it still comes down to acknowledging and helping normalize the worry and validating the feelings as opposed to as parents wanting to offer 100% reassurance or denial or whatever. I mean, that Mm -hmm. advice applies to many sad things right now too. Yeah. I mean, people have been asking me, and I know that some mental health professionals have been saying, we just want to reassure them about their safety. And that's a hard thing to do right now. And kids aren't believing us anymore when we reassure them, right? They're, they're not buying it. They're not buying it. And it doesn't help with ongoing trust. That's right. Rather than offering that reassurance and saying, you know, everything is going to be fine and you will always be safe. The flip side of that is we don't want to say, well, you're not going to be safe. We don't want to say that. What you want to say is, it is really okay for you to be worrying about this. I'm worrying about this too. It is really normal right now in any situation. You know, your child's going to the dentist to get a cavity filled. Your child is starting at a new school. Your child is getting a new babysitter. Your child, you know, whatever new thing they're stepping into or thing that feels challenging to just say, I totally understand why you'd be worried about this. I totally understand because we don't know exactly what's going to happen or you don't know what it's like to go to this summer camp. The impulse is to try and get rid of worry. That's the impulse. And the shift I want people to make is to allow it, to validate it oftentimes. There are things we worry about that we can't do anything about. If you've got a child who's really worried about death, if you've got a child who's really worried about sickness, if you've got a child who's really worried about bad things happening in the world, the hard part of parenting is that we can't say that won't happen, but we can say, I totally understand why you're feeling this way. And I would even expect that you will feel worried on the first day of, we're just going to expect the worry to show up rather than trying to get rid of it. So that shift in language is instead of saying, you shouldn't be feeling this way, in whatever way you're saying it, you could be saying that in a very loving way, a very reassuring way. We want to shift to, I understand and it's okay and it's normal that you feel this way. So we'll be right back after this short break. So Lynn, how are you liking your high of vitamins? I love them. Like I look forward to taking them. I do too. My son and I take them and I love that they have no added sugar and those other gummy vitamins I used to buy for my kids. Yeah. I always wondered if they were just as unhealthy as candy. I think they were actually. So my husband takes them too. We are both taking our high of vitamins. (laughs) They're sugar-free. They're non-GMO. They're vegan. They're dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, and nut-free. I love that pediatricians approved high vitamins because they're just a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, and they have 15 essential vitamins and minerals. If you've got picky eaters, this is an easy way to get them vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, all the stuff they need for their little growing bodies. Hyatt is so easy. They're mailed straight to your door. And after the first bottle and sticker pack, you receive monthly refills in eco-friendly packaging. Did you actually use the stickers and put your name on the bottle? Well, of course. <laughs> okay, I didn't do it. But I mean, I love the bottle. I love the bottle. I'm a grown up. Maybe I should put the stickers on my husband's bottle. He would probably like that actually. So we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamins. Receive 50% off your first order. And to claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash Fluster. This deal's not available on their regular website. So go to HayaHealth, H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash Fluster and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Are you feeling burnout these days, right? We're hearing a lot about burnout. Are you working too much? Maybe you're not taking enough time for yourself. When you're burnt out, you can feel a lack of motivation. You can feel irritable. You can be snappy with your kids. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause, actually. Any roles in our life can lead us to feel burnt out. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you, you've got to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing the stresses in your life. We know that people are stressed and we talk all the time about finding support and connection, 
For many of us, a professional can help us see things more clearly and give us the skills we need to manage this world we live in. I know a few people close to me who have actually accessed BetterHelp. It's been a great experience. If you're thinking you might need to talk to someone, BetterHelp is a great way to get started. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Lynn. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Lynn, L-Y-N-N. Don't put it off. Really, the goal is for you to feel better, to get back to your life, to get back to your family. Reach out now. Take that first step. Get in touch with BetterHelp, BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Lynn. Okay, we're back. Would you like parents to eliminate the phrase, don't worry? Yes, I would. Yeah. It's interesting. I was at a event. There was a speaker before me who was really tremendous, and he was really being open and vulnerable about his struggles with emotional management. And he was talking about his family. And one of the things he said is that in his family... And he said his parents loved him and his parents were trying to help him and support him. He was really struggling when he was a a young teenager and his mom put up a sign in his bedroom that said, don't worry, be happy. And he said that his family never talked about what was going on emotionally with them. And it really led to him having some significant struggles which he has now addressed. He's an incredibly successful guy right now. That's the message, right? When we say don't worry, or we say there's nothing to worry about. Or what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, that's the other thing, right. What's the worst that could happen where he says, I got this, hold on, hold my beer. Being able to really allow, we're going to expect it to show up. Why are we going to expect it? Because life is uncertain in big ways and in, and in small ways, life is uncertain. We want to give kids the language to say, it's okay that I feel this way. I can handle it. I can step into it. It's normal. It's such a vital first step. That's why it's the first puzzle piece. We're shifting out of elimination and out of eradication. So I hated summer reading as a kid, but as a grown up, I'm willing to take some summer homework. What's our summer homework? Okay, here's the concrete things I want you to do as you're working on this puzzle piece. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to look for opportunities to point out the normal existence of worry. Maybe it's a performer. Maybe it's an athlete. You know, we listened to Bill Hader talk about how nervous he was before he was performing on Saturday Night Live, but he figured out how to expect it and not push back against it. You're watching baseball or you're watching tennis or you're watching whatever sport and you hear somebody talk about that. You can pay attention to your language when you're talking about stepping into something new. So for example, say you do something new, say you have a challenging thing that you're dealing with. You say to your kids, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous about this. Oh gosh, I'm nervous. I'm not going to drink my coffee this morning. I already feel caffeinated. But you know what? This is the way it's going to feel. I got this, right? Oh gosh, I'm nervous. Instead of saying like, oh, I'm freaking out. Why am I freaking out? I'm not going to be able to do this. Oh, I hate when I feel this way. And you begin to use that language of expecting and allowing it as you're stepping into situations. Look for opportunities to talk about expecting worry to show up. Keep your ears open for them and pay attention to it. That's your homework. Do you mean saying like, wow, that pitcher must be really nervous in the final inning of this game? Is that what you mean? What's the language you want us to say? Say you were watching a pitcher, you might say like, oh gosh, I I bet he's got some nerves going on right now. My husband likes to watch tennis and we'll say like they're serving for the match in some big tournament and we'll say like, oh boy, I don't know how you handle those nerves, right? Or we'll say like, look at, notice how he starts taking a few deep breaths or notice how he is walking around a little bit. 
I just want to have you point out to your kids that people are managing their worry. They're allowing it to be there. We're expecting it to show up. Say you're going to go do something. Just say, oh, I was feeling nervous before I did that. And I knew my worry was going to show up. This is how it's going to go. This is normal, right? We want to normalize it instead of that language that says like, oh, I can't feel this way or, oh gosh, I wonder how they're getting rid of it. Or I have to use my breathing to get rid of my worry. Allow, allow, allow. It's going to show up. It's a normal part of being a human. Let's take a break and talk more about that. Oh, we've all been noticing the jump in gas prices. Families, we need ways to bring down monthly costs. And it's summer. So you want to have money to spend on the fun stuff and like the family stuff. More money for that family vacation or that baseball game with the kids, even just a fun dinner out. That's where Auto Approve can help. Auto Approve is an online service that makes vehicle refinancing easier and faster. It connects vehicle owners with a network of top credit unions, banks, and finance companies to find the best available interest rates. Then it helps handle the paperwork, simplifying the whole vehicle refinance process from beginning to end. Most people are paying too much on their vehicle loan and auto rates are actually still historically low. So don't count yourself out. So here's the bottom line. Auto Approve offers auto refinancing and auto lease purchasing. With refinancing, Auto Approve saves customers money and they make it easy for vehicle owners to find and compare the best available rates. With Auto Approve, vehicle owners can lower their monthly payment and get a better rate or both. They help you save money. Remember, auto loans are still historically low, so get more money for what matters most to you with Auto Approve. To find out how much you could save, get your free quote at autoapprove.com slash Atalyst. That's autoapprove.com slash A-D-A-L-Y-S-T. And right now, not only will AutoApprove put hundreds, even thousands back in your pocket, but our listeners that refinance through AutoApprove will get $100 cash sent right to your mailbox. So get your free quote at autoapprove.com slash Atalyst. Okay, so now back to the show. We were on a spring break, and this is what's making me think of this. There's a family karaoke night, and I was like, to my husband and your brother, I was like, you're singing. So he has this short list of songs that he'll always sing for, <laughs> for the families amidst <laughs> teens and tweens, you know, often singing Let It Go or Do yeah. You Want to Build a Snowman? But this was actually great. They were singers of all ages, but a mom went up with her daughter, and you could tell the mom and the daughter love singing together in the car. But the daughter was maybe 10. The daughter did not want to do it. So she sat like her arms were folded and she was like making a big grouch face. Mm -hmm. So the mom was like, they're calling our name. So I'm going up. Mm -hmm. So then eventually the daughter comes up and she's terrified. Mm. And you watched in real time her hesitate and be very scared. And then eventually like everyone was so encouraging and applauding. Then she was just like really beautifully singing. Mm -hmm. and. I was sobbing. <laughs> of course you were. Of course I was you sobbing. Were. It was so beautiful yeah. to watch the process. Yes. And yes. we as a family talked about that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mom might have kind of pushed her into the deep end. And then fortunately, the daughter, you know, was able to learn to swim in that singing moment. But mm -hmm. if you were in that position, what would your advice be? Well, so when we're trying to get a child to do something... So maybe let, let's just say one scenario, could have, the mom could have said like, look, I'm signing you up and you're doing this whether you like it or not. And reassure like there's, you're a beautiful singer. There's no need for you to be nervous. I don't know what you're worried about, right? That's the shutting down of the worry. But maybe the mom said, look, you have a beautiful voice. I want you to share it. You're going to feel nervous when you come up, right? I'm going to feel nervous when we start, but let's see. Let's give it a try. Let's see how this goes. And maybe that was enough to open up the opportunity for the daughter to, to step up and sing and discover. I mean, clearly she wasn't psyched about the idea. So it's, it's saying to kids, of course, you're going to be nervous. Of course, you're going to be worried. Let's give it a try. And not talking them out of it, not saying like, look, there's no reason for you to be nervous. There's no reason for you to be worried. The other thing, too, that I would say in this situation is that I would hope 
that the mom would do some post-game analysis. Like, wasn't that interesting to say, like, I want you to remember this moment because starting, remember you were nervous, you were unsure. That's totally fine that you felt that way. And then look what happened once you got into it. Look what you discovered about yourself. It's totally fine to feel a little nervous or tight or worried at the beginning and then let yourself warm up. When kids have those successes, you don't have to give them a big, huge lecture about it, but you want to give them the opportunity to recognize that it's okay that your worry showed up, it's normal for it to show up, and then look what happened. Some parents might be saying, well, what if, what if she just refused? What if she just sat there with her arms crossed? Then you use that as an opportunity to say, we can try that again right? I went up without you and I sang and I was a little nervous, but it's okay that your worry showed up. Let's just make sure that we have opportunities in the future to keep practicing this skill. The skill is when you're starting something that feels difficult, challenging, when you're performing, that the worry is going to show up and how do you warm up and how do you get some momentum going so that you can find your footing? That has to happen experientially. This is why avoidance is doing the disorder right? We don't force, we don't push them in if we don't have to, but looking for opportunities to practice the skill and naming the skill, that's the process. I don't care what content you're practicing it in, practicing the process. I feel nervous and then I got used to it. I warmed up. I felt encouraged. I felt supported and look what I did. That's a success. Yeah, it's great when the family is uh, learning your mantra mm-hmm. that it's success when you say, I was super uncomfortable mm-hmm. today when I did something. That's right. Versus, oh, I did it and I didn't worry at all. I mean, that's great too, right? Have at it. But, you know, as I was saying about this guy that I was listening to speak at this presentation that I was at, he was totally nervous and he owned it. He said at the beginning, like, I'm really nervous about this. And then at the end, I, he said, I feel like I've done something for myself. I hope you liked what I said, but I've done something for myself here. I've retrained my amygdala. I've laid down some new neural pathways. So we just have to make room, make room, make room. I'm going to get you a birthday present coffee mug that says, I've retrained my amygdala. Oh, well, the other mug that you are going to get me is the one that says, talk 85% less. But that's not toward me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, please talk 85% more. Oh, that's very sweet of you. I don't know that anybody that's close to me has ever asked me to talk 85% more. I think that's not ever happened. Since I was two years old, I think everybody's like, okay, thank you, Vinny. Okay, 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 honey. Yep, we got it. Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So join our Facebook community so you can ask Lynn a question and connect with our listeners. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.